Hey everybody, welcome back into this magic, magic room. People call it a Zoom room, but I call it a magic room because somehow what happens in this room is so beautiful. And I've watched now, I've had over 150 conversations with people I don't know. In all transparency, the woman that I have in front of me today is someone that I do know, but I only know her a little bit so we can still do the conversation. She was kind enough to have me on her podcast, which is a pure, happy, healthy podcast. And we had just such a beautiful conversation. I, I just instantly fell in love with her. And I said, I want to have you on something that I do. And, and we arranged that. And uh, she is not in the US. We're going to find out where she is. I think she's over in Europe, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, <clears throat> The show is sponsored by The Mosaic, which I want to get out of the way right, right off the bat. The Mosaic is a story about a boy who loses his parents two years apart on the same day. And when he asks the adults where his parents are, they tell him they're in a place called heaven. So he sets out in search of the place called heaven. And the people he meets are not the priests and ministers, but the common ordinary people. And he wonders, why am I meeting these people? But he sits with them and listens to their story. In every single case where he heard them, where he listens to them, the person he now sees is completely different than the one he walked up to. And it isn't because they've changed, it's because his, his notion of them has changed. And after that happens so many times, he wonders to himself, do I see anything in the world the way it is? Or do I see everything the way I see it? And I wonder what life would look like if I got out of the way and saw the world the way it is. At that moment, he looks over to the right and he sees a monk unzipping the sky and inviting him to walk through to a parallel reality where he meets the wise one who's the keeper of the mosaic. It's because of that story, it's because of that process of listening that my life completely changed. And it's be that's one of the, re the big reasons why I'm doing conversations with strangers. Because my, the book itself told me when I finished writing it, get out on the road, do what, you're, do what Mo did. Speak to people no one speaks to, listen to people no one listens to. Go out there and listen to what people are actually saying if they were given the opportunity to say what they wanted to say without being interrupted. The purpose of this room is to love and accept people, to listen to them and hear them, and to acknowledge and validate them. So with that beautiful, beautiful thought, I want to see if I can say this beautiful woman's name correctly. Leandra Hopp, welcome to Conversation. How are you? Hi, and thank you so much for this beautiful introduction. And you said my name pretty perfectly. <laughs> I love that. I admit it's hard to say my name. It's um, it's pronounced at least German. So um, especially English speaker, speaking people have uh, sometimes a bit of a struggle with it. <laughs> I'm such a gringo. I realized, you know, I think I think I'm this <laughs> multicultural person, but I'm really like just this. <laughs> Tell people who you are and what's important to you, Leandra. Yeah, uh, thank you first of all for having me in, in this beautiful um, concept of conversations with strangers. We know each other a little bit, <laughs> but yeah, I um, would love to share who I am. Um, yeah, I will start it. I probably have different layers about me. There's, first of all, um, I'm a soul inhabiting a human body and um, making a human experience here on earth and yeah came to love this body which i'm inhabiting that probably will dive deeper into in a second that wasn't always the case but um yeah i'm happy to do so now and um, can appreciate this human experience therefore even more now um then i'm a person that uh yeah a woman um born and raised in Germany. Um, I have different traits about me. Um, I love to travel, for example. I'm very curious. I love to speak to new people and strangers. And I think it's really important to stay curious about life and other people and stay curious about learning. 
and that's why I have my podcast and that's why I love to be on other shows as well because I think life is about learning and also finding out who we are on a deeper level and that happens through different experience that we make I think and therefore continue this learning process that yeah is connected to that human experience which we're making um yeah and then I um have a purpose in my life but then I also have a job and in some sections I would say they intercross in some others maybe a bit less um so I would say my purpose here on life is to bring change first of all and then um to spread positive um yeah motivation maybe or inspiration and leading by inspiration for giving others the opportunity and also um, yeah, the permission to also change in their life. And that somewhat intercrosses, uh, fortunately now at least, with my work that I do and how I earn my money. <laughs> so I am an expert on nutrition, on, um, yeah, not in terms of counting calories or any diet that I will tell you, but more so that I think it's so important to find one's own intuition and to find um, the connection back to your body, where we get back to the beginning that I was saying, I never, I, yeah, I had a big struggle in my life with that and therefore I had to learn it. And so I think, um, yeah, it's such a big chance. It was at least a big chance for me to learn back to love myself and therefore learn about my body and learn what my body needs and really listen to my body. And therefore I got a really highly um, strong intuition in all aspects of my life, but especially about food. And I think as we're eating, like around three times a day, an average, I would say, um, it's something that we can really practice on, practice uh, behavior and how we deal with ourselves and how we treat ourselves and also learn how to strengthen our intuition about that. Um, yeah, so I'm also offering hypno, um, hypnosis, hypnotherapy to help people get back that intuition and trust their bodies and lose weight, gain weight, however they feel best in their bodies. What am I doing this far away? I should be with you, but you know, I should be like right sitting at your feet here. I have... <laughs> <laughs> so well, I <laughs> <that's good. laughs> there is so much to unpack in what you're saying. And I just want to invite the listener in to just get a sense of who Leandra is. Because as you hear her speak, do you feel how, how beautiful her soul is? Do you feel how connected she is to the work that she does and to the person she is? And do you feel already in the first few seconds of our conversation, her sharing with you that her purpose has come as a result of some of the work that she had to do on herself. And when she realized that she had, a, she had this work to do, that she thought there might be other people out there that might have the same work to do and how beautiful that is to come from her own experience rather than from just a head education. Um, yeah, what, definitely. What makes you happy? What makes me happy? I, I would generally say happy for me is more like a general state or like a mindset. Um, I am, I'm not sure if, for me, it's somehow connected with being content and feeling really pure and aligned with myself and my surroundings and all the actions that I take. And when I feel so aligned and um, so content in my life, then I'm happy. But I try to or work on this to, to be like this all the time. So I would say I'm, I'm generally happy, but sometimes of course I'm, I'm a human and therefore I have sad feelings but therefore I would never say I'm sad because I am not sad from my essence. I am naturally in a state of happiness and maybe sometimes obstacles come my way. And then I can say maybe this action made me feel sad or I got a bit angry here or um, 
yeah, I, I feel pain, but that does not determine who I am. So I think happiness is more a state and therefore, I don't know if any action would make me, maybe there's things that make me even more happy, but I'm, I'm generally happy. So yeah. what I love, and, and you say it as if it's so natural that it's just, it almost comes across as, um, it's so natural to you, it doesn't even want to form a question. And yet I hear there's so many people that are, I bet there's so many people that are listening that say, what does that mean, that state of mind where we're in alignment with ourselves and we are in, in tune with ourselves and we are happy and our state of mind is happy. Like we're in the middle of a pandemic, we're in the middle of a civil rights through campaign, we're in the middle of a Me Too movement. All the structures around me are falling apart. I'm scared, I'm afraid. What does that mean for you that you can align yourself to your happiness? I mean, I know what you're talking about, but I want you to explain it because it's such a beautiful state. And I want you to be able, if you can, to share that process of how you realign or how you align to yourself when you come out of sync. Such a good question, because I think I would have not understood myself just maybe like five years ago or something. I would have thought, what is she talking about? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so thank you for asking again. So um, yeah, I uh, should explain it a bit more <laughs> for everyone to understand. Um, yeah, I think it's um, really a process of getting to know yourself and going, not holding on to feelings or not holding on to situations because it's actually proven that a feeling is just something if you don't hold on to it it just stays with you for three minutes so if you don't hold on to a feeling and you just observe it and let it go again then you can stay in your essence if that makes sense it, it <laughs> makes sense and i want to slow it down because i to people who do this process, it's so clear and it's so it's obvious and it makes complete sense. But to people who don't, like, what does that mean to not hold on to a feeling? Like, I feel hurt by my friend. I feel I feel mad. I feel angry. It's a situation that happened. How do I not hold on to that? Hmm. What I always do when something bad happens to me is, first of all, I go into it and first feel it and then i'm like oh okay i'm mad now then i think okay but who does this actually help that i'm mad now or i'm sad now and then i realize okay i'm i'm having really bad feelings about this like do i need to feel this actually like who is it serving now that i'm mad definitely not the person that I'm mad on, but actually I'm the one who's suffering in this moment. And then I can decide, then I can decide, do I want to suffer right now? Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes, I mean, I have these moments when I say, okay, actually I'm pissed and I want to live this now because I kind of give in that situation. Um, but sometimes I feel, okay, it's, it's, I actually don't need this in my life right now. Like it's only harming me right now. And I don't want to feel this way actually. So I make a conscious decision about if I want to feel that feeling or not. And then another tool that can be used in this situation when something, you think something really bad happened in your life, like um, Let's take an easy example. Maybe your bike or car gets stolen or something like this. Of course, there's that first feeling of being so mad and why is it happening to me? And I need my car, I need my bike. What will I do now without it? Um, but then again, I think, okay, I cannot change the situation right now. It has happened. Um, I won't have my bike back now probably uh, or my car. And um, so I will have to live with this consequence right now. And my options are now to either become really mad and maybe even beat up other people because I'm so mad or just hit my fist into um, a wall and hurt myself or scream and yell and feel really bad the whole next week. 
or I can say, okay, this is not good, obviously, recognize it and say, I don't like that my bike is stolen, but the only person that is suffering when I'm mad and sad now is me. So I can just move on with my life and um, try to think of solutions that can help me in this way. Maybe, okay, maybe I need to work an extra shift so I can buy another car or another bike. Let's, let's rather stay with this, another bike. Um, or yeah, what can I do? Maybe a friend has a cheap buy, a spare bike, which I can buy or borrow for the next week. Um, and then if it is a worse example, maybe than just, just the bike, um, then you can go into gratitude. Let's say someone who you love um, passes away. Of course, there's that moment of being sad and it's completely okay also, I think, to feel that sadness and maybe even hold on to that sadness for a little bit. Um, but again, then you have the chance and the opportunity to decide, do you want to hold on to the sadness for your whole life? Maybe, maybe even become depressive or maybe, yeah, harm yourself because you feel so bad about that loss or do you choose to live your life and start to actually be happy and be more happy before because first of all, the person maybe didn't want you to suffer, right? And then second of all, going into gratitude. And that means that you think, even if you have experienced a loss, if it's of a bike, a car, a person, or anything that happens to you in life, to see what you have in life that is already good. And starting with life itself, I wake up every morning, I'm healthy, I, I'm alive, I have a human body, I still got the experience to live 24 hours a day and do with these 24 hours what I would like to do. Um, and going into this gratitude just suddenly really shifts perspective, I think, that you look on it on a, on a very different level and not such a severe and heavy level anymore, but you really get into that lightness um, that just makes life so much easier and on the long run um, gets you into this more aligned and pure um, mindset that leads to happiness. What I love about what you're saying, and I really love what you're saying, is that we have a choice in any moment to choose the way we're going to feel. And we might make the choice that we want to be angry. We might make the choice that we want to be sad. There's nothing wrong with being sad. If that's our choice to be sad. If we want to go into our sadness and understand our sadness and go through it and, and understand it and walk through it. But we also have a choice whether to build our home in that sadness or to, or to keep or to use it as a, a bridge that we're walking over to understand it, to see it, to walk through it, to get to the other side of it. And we don't have to build a home in it. So oftentimes, I myself, I know myself, I had a situation happen where years ago I had an affair when it was something I don't, I, I was a big proponent against having an affair. And having that affair affected me for so long because I felt like it took away my, I lost my integrity as a human being. And I defined myself by this is who I am. I'm a man of integrity. And so when I had that affair, I said, well, man, I can't be a man of integrity anymore because a man of integrity doesn't have an affair. But it's only been in the last few years that I've put some peace to that by saying, no, a man of integrity doesn't not make mistakes. A man of integrity makes, also makes mistakes. He admits his mistakes. He apologizes for his mistakes. And he goes on from his life accepting the fact that he does make mistakes and he owns up to his mistakes and tries to heal the people that have been hurt by that situation. Mm -hmm. Completely, complete change of perspective, complete change of choice, because my choice was, no, I need to suffer from this lack of what I did because I really hurt myself. I really hurt somebody. I hurt my wife. I hurt the woman I was with. I hurt, you know, my, my community that I was a part of. And I just had all this pain that I felt like I had to feel until I made yeah. the choice to say, no, I, that's not, that isn't what integrity is. 
I'm going to redefine my definition of integrity to allow me to still be a man of integrity who just fell down one time and is strong enough to say everybody falls down. Yeah, you said something so important right here that we, first of all, it's so important to forgive. I think not only to forgive people around us, but also to forgive ourselves. And I think that is connected to what I just said before again, yeah. that that's holding on to this, this feeling of being mad or feeling guilt or maybe shame around something. And that again is something that we can choose. If I choose to forgive others and myself, then I myself will feel better. It's not about saying the action of another person was okay if they did something really bad, but it's about making myself free from this negative thought that is planting negative emotions inside of me. So by forgiving others, I make myself free. And obviously you can apply that to yourself because that's even the most important person, I, I would say, to forgive, like forgive yourself. Because looking back, you probably always did the best you could at every moment of your life because otherwise you would have not acted out of this perspective, right? Yeah. Otherwise you would have done something different. So I think it's important to look back on your younger self with so much compassion and understanding, even though from a perspective now you would probably do things different, but you've grown. And that was part of the learning experience I was talking about earlier, that by learning more, we can act out of a different consciousness, but Back in the day, we, we didn't know about this. So we yeah. made maybe a choice that we say now it doesn't really make sense of our understanding anymore. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you for bringing this up. This is um, super important. And then also allowing yourself to fail. I don't like the word fail. It always is so connected in such a negative way, but allow yourself to make mistakes because that's the biggest gift in life actually because it teaches you more than the good things yeah. <laughs> that that maybe happen everything you remember from your past is usually the things where you fail quote unquote yeah. um, because that's where you learned how to do it better so i think it's again here show compassion to yourself failing <laughs> and yeah. making mistakes one of the people that I loved having on my show is someone who calls himself the fail coach. <laughs> and it, it is so the antithesis of what we would think we hire a coach for. We hire a coach to succeed. He's the only fail coach that I think in the world, but he, <laughs> he teaches people to fail because he says, until we take the risk to do stuff that we may or may not succeed at, we will never be able to find success because we'll always stay comfortable in our own little boxes. So I love the word, word fail, by the way, because I just think that it's just, we can't, nothing in life that has ever proved to be fabulous or good or beneficial to the world has ever come without a ton of failure, a ton of tries, a ton of things that didn't work. And so why do we feel like, you know, what is the sense that we have to always succeed, that we always have to get it right, that we have to do it perfect, when in fact, failing is the most essential part of, of, of doing things right? Yeah. I've heard from, I had an interview from my podcast with an American entrepreneur, and he said that usually big companies um, hire people in high positions um, only if they can prove that they have failed a lot of um, uh, entrepreneurships because that basically shows them that they've already done the mistakes and the chance of failing again, basically. Oh, I see. And I thought it was a really smart thing to do and a really funny way of, of, of doing things. And uh, yeah, so right. Yeah. Such a good way. What's important to you? Love and being connected with others. And love, maybe a lot of people think um, love is only something that happens between sexual partners. Um, I think love can be really be everywhere and everything. Um, starting from the love to yourself, which in my history was my biggest obstacle, which I had to learn 
on a very yeah long journey let's say so now i can appreciate it even more so love to yourself your your own body um love to others um, but also love to the to the things that you do you like i have been working or i was working as a barista making coffee like like professionally really high quality coffee and it's so interesting because just as an example even if in the same coffee shop there are the same beans the same coffee machine the same milk just another person doing the coffee exactly the same way exactly the same measurements exactly the same cup will taste completely different wow. and i came across that it really depends on the intention and the mood of the person and basically the love that the person put into that cup of coffee you can see this when when you go to a restaurant if your food is made with love you you taste it yeah. um if that you have a handyman coming over and they do the job with love you see it and you feel it and so i think you can apply love to everything so i love I, I love that because i I, I think we spoke about the fact that I have a developmentally delayed daughter on your show. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when she comes, she lives in a group home and, and we just got to see her for the first time in six months because mm -hmm. this home was on lockdown and it's her birthday coming up soon. And hopefully we're going to be able to bring her back with us. So we'll go from quarantine to car to quarantine. I think it will be okay, but we have to get approval for it to see if it can happen because they're on lockdown. But when she's here every morning after giving her her bath, I say, where's daddy going to go? And she says, and she says, daddy's going to go up the stairs. And I said, what's daddy going to do? She says, he's going to make me the best breakfast ever. <laughs> and I say to her, Alisa, why is it the best breakfast ever every day? Because it's, I, I make you a similar breakfast every day. Why is it the best breakfast ever? And she says, because daddy, you put all daddy's love into the breakfast. Aww, that's and, so good. and it's so beautifully is yeah. illustrates the point that you're saying. Um, you've referenced it a couple of times. Let's go, let's go to it because it ties into your work. It ties into your life. It ties into that place. Because obviously looking at you now, you're in love with your, you're, you've taken care of your body. You love your body. There's so many people in the workplace of helping other people where myself included, where we help others and help others and think about others and are completely available for others, but we're not completely available to ourselves. We let our bodies go. We let our bodies down. Our bodies have pain. Our bodies have, you know, gain weight. Our bodies do those things. Talk to me about that moment where you realized you, your body was worth taking care of, that you were worth having a body that was taken care that was worth taking care of? Mm. I have to start a little bit earlier, basically in my early youth, I would say. Um, I had a very difficult family situation um, where my parents divorced and I just got very, um, I just got twins siblings when I was nine years old and then my parents divorced right after this. Um, so my parents were really, it was just too much for them. And then my mom had, um, psychological issues because of this. And, um, it was really, my father had some affairs, so it was really a very stressful and difficult time. And I was, um, always had a really good relationship actually, or like a very normal relationship to my body and to food. I grew up very in an organic family and very healthy, very connected to nature. Um, and then um, in around maybe the age of 12, 13, um, I started to cope um, with food for emotional stress. So I started eating lots of chocolate and lots of sweets and I, in, not in a healthy way, but in a, yeah, just coping with em emotional emptiness and coping with all the stress that I had to go through. And I didn't have any other outlet of, of the stress and this emotional um, yeah, neglect um, that I felt in this time. 
So I gained a bunch of weight and I went to the US for a high school exchange when I was 15 and then 16. Um, and that's really when it took on pace because I lived with a host family that also had a very unhealthy lifestyle. So there it really reached this peak that I was just eating all day long and I gained six kilo within only one month. And I really neglected my body basically and was not listening to any signs anymore. And I had, I was a point where I had completely lost uh, any intuition or any feeling for my body. And um, yeah, just also had completely lost um, a normal or like a good um, sense about food and nutrition in that moment. Um, and then I changed my host family and that host family. Yeah. That, that's just, I just want to invite the listener in. Is there anything Leandra is saying right now that you can relate to? Can you relate to a moment in your life where you lost control, where you made choices to eat out of comfort rather than out of nutrition? The reason they call it comfort food is because it brings comfort in the moment. It doesn't bring comfort in the long in the long end, but it brings comfort in the moment. It fills the body up, but it's not necessarily the most healthy thing for us to eat. Most likely, in most cases, it isn't the most healthy thing to eat. Can you can you find those times in your life where you started to eat from an emotional need rather than from a, a hunger? It was a hunger to fill an emotional void rather than a hunger to nutritionally support your body. Can you, can you associate with that? And can you tie in what we were already talking about of this need of allowing our emotions to pass through us rather than holding on to it? And can you see how it's starting to link in to the whole story that Leandro is saying? Okay. So, Go ahead, please. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to bring you in. Yeah, it's super important. I think so many people have come to that point and one point of their life. So it's good to reflect on that, definitely. Um, yeah, so I changed my host family and they were really health conscious, very um, healthy, counting calories, going to the gym. So exactly the opposite. And that was the first time in my life that I found out what a calorie is and that I even yeah, started counting calories and got into heavy sports, practicing every single day. Um, and I saw that I was losing weight and that my body got into shape. And obviously that was a very good feeling. And I got so many compliments from the outside that really kept me on this way and was giving me so much approval from the outside. Um, that I was very happy with that path I was going. Um, and that just took on for maybe, yeah, three years or so. And um, without me noticing it, um, I started to eat less and less and less, counting more calories, being more restrictive, um, doing more exercise, really heavy workouts. Um, even sometimes I would go at four o'clock at night after I was still hanging out with friends because I had that um, cookie, I would still go to the gym. And before I could notice, I really found myself in an anorexia, which is an eating disorder for the ones who have not uh, heard about it. Um, and I, it took me a really long time to figure out by myself that I was getting into that, that circle. So I had lost the connection to my body again but this time in a really opposite direction so in instead of losing the control i took over the control and was controlling too much and controlling my body in a way that i would not uh, allow my body to do anything not to feel i was really numbing myself with not eating and not letting any emotions, not any feelings and, and not any needs like hunger come up and not even the, the need to maybe stop exercising when I was already exercising for two hours and my body was so exhausted already, I did not hear, listen to that. So I lost really that connection again to my body. So again, I just want to pause for a minute because Leander's saying so much that I just want to slow it down for a minute and just invite the listener to hear. 
do you hear how beautifully important moderation and control is? When you lose control and give up control, what's possible? When you become too controlling, what's possible? And how do you find the balance of where control and, and surrender to life sort of coexist and dance together? And I don't know if that's where we're going, but I just want to ask that it's not only important in the food that we eat and the nutrition that we have, but in everything in life. The food right now is a metaphor for everything that we do in life. Finding that place where we're main, so many of us are control freaks and we want to just make sure that we have control of a situation and how that control can cause an anorexic type of life, so to speak, in this situation and how giving up control can just cause an obese lifestyle. And so how do you find that place where you're aligned? Remember, Leandro was talking about being aligned. How do you find that place of alignment where it's neither too much control or too little control? Okay, I'm sorry. I just wanted to bring context. Yeah, yeah and it took me a very long time to figure out myself that I actually have a problem and that I do need help. And I'm really grateful for the people in my life that um, yeah, took care of me and were very softly suggesting that I should get professional help with this. Um, so I was seeking for professional help. It took a while because when you have that control, then obviously you don't want to give up that control and you just want to hold on to the control. Like, I have my life under control. Everything is okay. I'm not eating, but I'm fine. And um, so that is a difficult, was a difficult process even to to ask for help and to surrender to that help. Did you actually feel that you were fine or was that just the story you were telling yourself to continue being in the story you were in? First, I thought I was fine. <laughs> and then later I was telling myself this story and I convinced myself so much that I really started to believe it, that I'm fine. But yeah, it, deep in the inside, I knew something was wrong already. And I mean, I was so thin, it was really obvious to see him. Um, yeah. yeah, so, mm -hmm, sorry. That's okay, and I, I just, again, I wanna bring the listener into the conversation. So where in your life have you told yourself you're fine and you really are fine, which is beautiful, what a beautiful place to be. And where in your life have you convinced yourself that you're fine when you know you're not fine? because you want to show up to the world in a way that you think shows up um, better than the way you are, rather than just having the courage to show up the way you are. Yeah. Yeah, such an important, important aspect. Yeah, it's everything you're saying. I just am slowing it down to highlight yeah, thank some, you. Of, <laughs> underline some of those places. Um, yeah, so my story continued that I got professional help and I really had to learn again um, how to um, nourish my body, what foods are actually good for me. I really had to, like a child, basically learn about portions again and um, about regular eating, about eating times. And that was really a process. It took years to get to the point when I was independent on my thoughts from when I could liberate myself from the thoughts about that constant food struggle. Um, but that was the most important um, and the most learning experience journey in my life, I would say, because through this journey, I've really come to a point now where I have such a sensitive feeling towards my body that I immediately know when something is off. I, the connection now between my mind and my body is so strong that my body will send me signs and I know immediately something is off and I need to listen deeper to that point. So give me a, give me a real life example of something like that that's happened to you that you can, so that people can understand because it's, it sounds, I mean, we, I, we may understand what you're saying, but I want you to give like a case study or something like that where you saw, I did this and my body did this. And so people can get a sense of how, how exact that is. 
So it works on two different levels. So I give you two different examples, I would say. Um, first of all, my body gives me signs, what it needs in terms of food, which I call intuitive eating. Um, so for example, when um, I feel like I have really want a craving for broccoli, I know that I need to be careful because broccoli has the highest vitamin C from all vegetables or one of the highest. And I know when my body is craving for broccoli, I have a lack of vitamin C and I could possibly be on the edge of getting sick. So, or if I want, um, what, um, what's the word for it? Uh, Lauch, I think it's a, it's kind of like a long onion. Okay. Um, leek, a leek. leek. Yeah, exactly. Uh, leek. So if I want leek, um, I'm maybe about to get a throat infection because leek has a uh, disinfectant um, and attributes. So if you eat it, if you eat leek, it disinfects your throat and everything down here is antibacterial. So without actually feeling sick, I know that I need to be careful that this might happen if I don't go after my cravings. So, so I, lo I love you and I'm, I'm hearing the audience right now thinking, uh, my problem, I only wish my problem was that I had a craving for a broccoli or a leaf, <laughs> right? My craving is for sweets or for sugar or for carbs or for pasta or for pizza or for something, you know, that is just like, like your body is so finely tuned that you crave broccoli and you understand what that means. But what do you say to somebody who craves something that is, that is um, completely comfort-based, but not nutritionally based? Yeah, so you already said it basically, we have comfort foods, um, things that we eat maybe because we want emotional comfort. And that is mostly sugar because sugar, triggers some parts in our brain that are also, for example, um, responsible for um, when we take cocaine, triggers the same parts of our brain. So when we eat sugar, we slowly develop an addiction and like um, things get released in our brain that make us want more sugar and that release like a feeling of comfort and like a good feeling like after this chocolate, oh, I feel so good and I feel so in comfort. So people have different motivations, obviously, of eating. And when you notice that you are constantly craving for sugar, for example, or for the burgers or the pizza or yeah, the, the junk food, let's call it, um, then maybe you want to take a second and think, what is my motivation now of eating? Do I feel sad and maybe want comfort um do i look for this this like kick that energy kick that is hitting me after i eat sugar or am i actually hungry so that is the first question and then the second thing is like all the foods nowadays are so highly processed that there are so many additives inside as well as sugar sugar is hidden in so many things even in stuff like bread and pickles and everything we find in cans and boxes usually so that we get addicted to these foods so we cannot talk about a real craving or a real intuition with these foods because it's an addiction rather than a real craving so the first step is usually to cut out or lower the amount that we eat these processed foods and to really reduce our sugar um, level that we get back into the intuition that we actually already have inside. And the more you practice that, the more aligned and attuned you will become with your body and the more your body starts telling you what it actually needs. And let's say your body is constantly craving for pasta, for bread, for chips, um, even maybe for chocolate, then that can be a sign that you need carbs because these are things that contain a very like condensed but fast uh, carb energy. So then you're just maybe so used 
to having pasta or having bread that maybe your body doesn't even know what other carbs are there if you've never given it to them. So what you could do if you have these cravings, for example, um, you could switch and try other foods, maybe banana, um, maybe like a really, like a lot of grains, maybe a healthy muesli without additives and without sugar and see how your body feels with that because that is also serving the purpose of giving you very fast carb energy, which your body supposedly needs in that moment, but on a more healthy way. And like this, you can slowly get the processed food out of your diet um, and therefore start to tune in really with yourself and ask yourself before you eat something, first of all, am I doing this um, out of like a comfort or because I'm seeking for this maybe good feeling of, yeah, feel getting wanting to be happy or wanting to be held or even um, often there's like childhood traumas behind that as well. Like the need for comfort or feeling good or feeling protected. Is that maybe behind it? And then the second question is, okay, if I'm craving carbs, um, maybe I exercise a lot. Okay, I need carbs. What foods with carbs would I also like to eat now, which are maybe not processed and not full of sugar and good for me? Is it possible to be going through trauma and still love your body? Um, which sort of trauma do you like going through a trauma at yeah, the moment? Like in, other words, in other words, we're talking about, you know, people who eat out of comfort, going through trauma, going through a, a loss, going through a family, a, a, a childhood issue or a lack of love in their life or, uh, or whatever it is that they're experiencing some sort of pain that they want the comfort food to give them an immediate. It's not only that it fills you up, it gives you an immediate sense of energy and you feel suddenly energized, but then a few, hour, a few moments later, you feel, uh, you know, I feel heavy and, and, and bloated. But is it, is it possible to go through those trauma situations? It has to be because people are, go, are doing it. Mm. But and love your body at the same time. Like I'm, I'm just hearing people say, wow, this is harder than I thought it might be, you know, to really be aware of what I'm going through and how do I, sur how do I, how do I solve my emotional issues? I've turned to food to do it, but how do, how do people disassociate food, which has nothing to do with their emotional issues that they've put in the place of the doctor of their emotional issues to remove that doctor and go to another foreign family to live with who doesn't do that, so to speak. I think to really fully and completely love your body, um, if you would fully and completely love your body, you would want to nourish it like your holy temple, right? Yeah. And you would want, if you love, you want to give the best and have the best and, and it's, it's just that feeling of so such a pureness, right? And if you love someone, you would just want the best for that person, right? Um, and just do the, the, the good things for that. And let's say your body is another person. Would you give trash food, which you know is not good for the other person, intended leave to the other person? I suppose not. So if you really want to treat your body like your holy temple, and nourish it with everything it needs, I think you would want to give it the best in all, the, in all aspects, in terms of enough sleep, in terms of good body care, in terms of healthy um, yeah, uh, practices, maybe about meditation or, or workout. I mean, for every person that is, is different, obviously, some like it more, some like it less. Um, but then really listen to your body and give your body the best possible for it. Um, I, and I mean, all, we all go through traumas and I think it's, it's also normal that traumas come up in our life and that sometimes we struggle. We have these moments where we, even if we love our body generally, we maybe have this moment again where we struggle really and see, oh, um, maybe I'm, I'm not aligned at the moment. I, but then we can take it as a learning experience again and, and see, okay, what is this telling us? Why does this trauma or this 
happening has such an impact on me that I suddenly have less love for my body or that I don't nourish my body in the way that I, um, that I actually can to bring it to the full potential. And then we can have a loving look there instead of judging that maybe and instead of making ourselves down for it, but then looking there, okay, what is still in me that wants healing, that wants to be more nourished? Where did I maybe ne neglect my body so far where I can um, improve to really give it the most love it possible? So I want to give you a very personal, um, very intimate story about myself to mm -hmm. sort of highlight what you're saying and to highlight why I personally left my body aside. Um, when I was younger, I, I was running 48 miles a week um, in exercise and I was bench pressing 345 pounds. So I was going to the gym regularly. I weighed about 170 pounds and I was bench pressing 345. I was running every day, um, 45 miles a week meant I was running 18 miles one day, you know, just to train for marathons and do that type of stuff. And it was when my body got highly attuned that I had the affair. And so somewhere along the line, I made a decision. Why would I want a body that is well taken care of when it produces the result of, of losing my integrity? And so I traded that feeling of a body for having my integrity back. And then I remember going out with another woman before I was married. I went out with another woman who said to me, I don't understand you. You you have the most beautiful priest living in your temple and your temple looks like shit. Like, why have you abandoned your temple? You have this beautiful priest that lives inside of it. And she said, one of the reasons I'm attracted to you is I have this beautiful temple, but I don't have a beautiful priest inside of me. And I think that we should get together because if your priest in my temple could build a coexist, coexist together, we would have what we're all looking for. Mm. And I understood how beautiful that was, but I also understood that my beautiful temple brought me to a place that I was most, the most unhappy I've ever been mm -hmm. by having an affair and losing, and losing my ability to make proper decisions. Speak on that for a minute if you can. Yeah. Not so much personally for me, but for, I mean, and you're welcome to speak personally to me. I'm happy to hear your counsel. Yeah. Yeah. I think there are so many reasons um, for us to put on a, like to put on a certain behavior towards our body. Um, there can be outer experiences like yours, for example. Um, but also, of course, um, beliefs that we have about ourselves. Um, maybe let's say um, you always felt um, very thin skinned and some bad things have happened in your past and you really feel like you need to protect yourself and therefore you eat on a lot of weight because that is how subconsciously you protect yourself um, or someone said something to you that really harmed you and um, made your uh, shape therefore your experience you have with your body so a lot of these outer things can really change the perception that we have about our body. But going back to putting on weight, etc., or lifting weights, I think it really does not matter how your body looks. Um, we're, maybe there's the perception that you can only be healthy and um, love your body when you're thin and fit. I would not say that. I would say for every person that is really individual, like what every person needs in terms of food is very individual. And also here, it's so important to listen to your inner voice and feel, how does my body want to be? Maybe I feel super beautiful when I'm really big and I have these curves and I just know how to navigate these curves and I feel super good and aligned and sexy with that. And then that's a very, you can love your body like this. And that is a very healthy and good attitude. And maybe it's 
being slightly underweight because then you feel very flexible and, and you feel light and you love to jump around. Maybe that's how your body feels best. And then you just have to listen to your body also. How do, how do you feel good in, in your body? What's mm -hmm. your perfect shape or size? Maybe some people love to work out every day and be full packed with muscles. And that's how they feel most aligned with, with their body. Maybe you don't like to exercise and rather stay lean. Um, so just saying um, I put on weight or something, if you still love your body like it, like it is, I think that is super beautiful. It has not, nothing to do if you love your body um, and, and if you're aligned on the shape of your body. Just wanting to add that. I love it. I, I want to thank you so much, Leander, for your time here and for all you shared with us. And uh, it's amazing how quickly time goes. Um, say that? <laughs> we didn't even get to the questions that I normally ask, but I think it was so valuable where we're going. One of the things that I, I've gotten from our conversation together, which I really value and I really thank you for, is how important the choices we make are and how important the stories we tell ourselves are and how it's okay whatever we feel okay with. Like we make the decision, do we want to be large or small? Do we want to eat healthy or not healthy? As long as we feel happy with that choice, we're, there's nothing, there's no reason to change. When we feel unhappy in those choices, when our body starts to act up and say, hey, you know something, there are pains and there are things that are here. Um, we have choices to make and we can go inside to decide, do we want to listen to our bodies and love our bodies? Or do we want to continue not to listen to them? And if we don't listen, it'll probably just act up a little bit more because it has something it's trying to say to us. And I love the beauty of your moderate approach that there is no right or wrong. There is just like along the way of who you are, how are you doing with who you are and the choices you're making. Um, so how do people get in touch with you if they want to? And I know we're gonna have all your links in the show notes, but what's the best way for them to reach you out to you? Yeah, uh, thank you for putting this together so beautifully. And just one last word I would like to say is like really try to maybe even close your eyes and for a second and tune in with your, the wisdom of your body and really let your body tell you. Your body is so incredibly smart. Your body has all the wisdom and all the knowledge that it needs and let that wisdom and knowledge come into your mind and into your soul and it will tell you everything that you need to know about nutrition but also about feelings and when to let go and everything so i would love to encourage the listeners to do this little exercise a few times daily to strengthen your intuition Absolutely. and <laughs> yeah you can um, reach out on instagram which is um where i'm pretty active at leandra haupt then I have my podcast, Pure Happy Healthy, and my website, Leandra-Haupt, so German, <laughs> .com. And yeah, you can find it in the show notes. It will all be there. Again, thank you so much for coming to those people who listen and, and to the show. I want to thank you for giving us the most valuable thing that you have in your life, which is your time. I hope that today you've loved being with Leandra as much as I've loved having her. I hope that you will contact her. I hope that you will take advantage of the beautiful knowledge that she has. I hope that this will be a turning point for all of us who are here today to start loving our bodies even more, to start loving ourselves even more, to start becoming aware of what we're putting into our bodies, what we're doing with our bodies, what's happening in the world around us, what are we eating out of hunger or out of the need to be comforted. Um, there are lots of ways to be comforted. We don't need to use food to do that. And to just close up my story, it wasn't my physical body that was attractive to people because even as my body got bigger, people were still attracted to me. It was sort of a, an energy that people felt and the trust that people felt in being together and in being with me that allowed them to open up and, and want to be with that person more. So I just look at the stories you're telling yourself of, uh, that, are, that are actually lies that you're saying to yourself around why you have to maintain a certain thing that, you, that doesn't do you well. Leandra, is there one last thing you want to say before we go? I already said it with a 
tune into your body and to your intuition. And thank you so much for having me and for your time. It's time is so valuable. So yeah, just use every new moment that is given to you in life, uh, every new 24 hours that you have in life to get closer to yourself and just tune in with yourself and start loving yourself, forgiving yourself and accepting yourself in this, in this body, in this human experience that you're making. Um, your soul is already pure. Um, you just need to find that pureness with your body and it's, it's definitely possible. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your time and the possibility for this beautiful interview. Thank you so much for being here. And for those of you who listen, if you like the show, please tell people you like about it. Please tell if you like Leandra, but like Leandra is saying, please share her with your friends. That's the way people grow. Imagine how beautiful it would be if strangers who meet in a room see other strangers meeting in a room and share that, share that strangeness with each other. And we become friends together in a world that is when people are strangers, the world becomes a strange world. But when people become our friends, the world becomes a friendly world. Make it a friendly world until the next stranger comes into the room. Be happy, be kind, treat each, treat each other with respect. Be happy and kind to yourself. Treat yourself with love and respect as well. And until the next show, thank you so much for being here. And we'll see you soon in this beautiful, magical room where strangers become friends. Thank you. Ciao.